My name is Jean-Pierre Lacroix. I'm president of Chiquitani Lacroix Brand Design. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm very fortunate to have with us two expert consumer packaged good marketers who are going to share with us their insights on the Blake Factor and packaging ROI. I have next to me Rob Pierce, who is heads up packaging at Campbell's Canada. And next to him, I have Kevin Lake, who is head of marketing for Purity Light, a leading manufacturer marketer of organic products. Rob, what is the role of packaging in your marketing mix? Um, in the marketing mix at Campbell's, packaging plays a very large role. Mm -hmm. um, it really is everything that we do. Um, we're a consumer goods packaging company. We make soup and um, lots of it, tons of soup and and other things, uh, V8, uh, V8 juices, V8 diffusion as well. And um, so packaging plays a large role, and it's really the only way that we can communicate any of the initiatives that we're working on at any given time. Um, if we have a line extension or a new product that comes out of uh, world headquarters or global, the global branch of Campbell's, um, and it needs to be adapted for, for Canada, uh, packaging is how we do that. And um, while advertising plays a role in the marketing mix, uh, design and packaging comes first. And it's really the way that we communicate a low sodium initiative, like the uh, initiatives we're working on right now, across uh, about 50 products at Campbell's Canada, reducing the sodium level. Um, so that comes first. Uh, we leverage and um, understand the fact that 100% of our consumer sees our packaging. Mm. That's great. What about yourself, Kevin? Um, well, JP, I, I look at it from a standpoint that um, packaging is one of the um, critical um, points of contact with the consumer at what I would call the moment of truth in the in the retail theater. So when the consumer is, is making his or her choice in terms of a brand um, at the retail shelf, um, your packaging is, is something that really needs to pop from shelf and, uh, and really reinforce benefits in your product in a very simple fashion. In the blink of an eye, literally, the consumer will make his or her decision. I also look on it as it's one of the key uh, reinforcements on a day-to-day -day basis, and it depends a lot on the, um, the overall purchase cycle and the consumption pattern behind a given brand. I actually place more emphasis as a marketer on packaging, particularly in a brand um, that, that basically competes in a category with a very long purchase cycle. That places your brand in the hands of the consumer and its packaging in the in the consumer's home um, on a on a regular basis. And if, for example, um, the consumer is is literally reaching for your package, this can come in the form of a lot of different categories. It can be breakfast cereal, can be uh, vitamins and supplements, such as some of the, the products that uh, my firm markets. But you really want to reinforce your equity and reinforce a a, a positive experience with the consumer through your packaging every single time they interact with it. So I, I consider it to be uh, as important of an element of your overall marketing mix, mix and, uh, and reaching your consumer and touching him or her uh, as any other element in the marketing mix. Yeah, Kevin, you really talked uh, a lot about my second question, which is uh, also the benefits of a well-executed packaging. So Rob, what's, uh, what's the benefit of, of a well-executed package? Um, well, the benefit is really that you get to um, communicate Either uh, a new a new a new initiative and innovation with your consumer, um, a message on your packaging. If it's well executed, people will notice it. You communicate the message right away. Uh, Kevin talked a little bit about the moment of truth. It's very true, and we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit more about the blink factor. But in that blink of an eye, you need to make sure that you communicate that brand equity, the emotional response that you gain from your from your packaging mm -hmm. design. Um, so the benefit really is people notice. What you're about, they notice uh, the change. If there is a change, they notice if it's a new new package, a new new product that you're offering, and they buy it. And if they buy it, then that is the business cycle completed, and you're building a brand. You're keeping shareholders uh, happy. Um, we we stay employed. We stay employed <laughs> gainfully, <laughs> and um, it, the, the best part for me is is actually building that brand and making that emotional connection with cons consumers. Um, so if it's well executed, then it really comes back to the numbers. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you if the if the product is on shelf and it stays on shelf for a long time, then you know, hey, you've executed that well and it has worked and it's resonating with consumers. 
So when you when you look at the challenges uh, you currently face in in developing packaging programs and marketing products at retail, you know, um, Kevin, what would be the key challenges that you face? <clears throat> Well, I, I could probably sum one of them up in, in, in a word differentiation. I think um, it's a highly competitive world out there, and, and um, you find in many instances something that you bring that's unique and different one day is, is mm -hmm. literally gone the next. Um, I think packaging is, is, is a relatively cost-effective way to continuously evolve in, in differentiating yourself to the, to the consumer. Um, you can do it on your graphics design. You can do it by removing a barrier that that, that uh, presents a, a challenge to the consumer. It could be everything from how you seal your package. If you want to look at things structurally. It could be, you know, how much packaging you use altogether um, to reinforce a positive in terms of sustainability. So I think um, one of the diff the most difficult thing is is to continuously reinvent yourself while still preserving. What are the core equity elements that you reinforce with the consumer in your packaging? I, I look at some of your own products. And, you know, I can think of red and white labels back to the you know mm -hmm. days of my childhood, and uh, it reinforces your brand. For me, I have you know vitamins and supplements that I want to own a color of blue. Things, some things will never change, but others you have to continuously evolve and, and stay one step ahead. Um, you know, a lot of the private label guys are very nimble, and uh, they, they they will be very quick to pick up the best practices of, of some of the branded players and adapt them. So staying current, staying uh, differentiated is really, I think, what uh, what I tend to focus on for packaging. Great. Rob, you know, how do you find that balance? Obviously, you're working <clears> on <throat> brands that uh, have been around for a long time, well-established, a lot of equity. Where do you find that balance, you know, when a when, uh, brand manager comes to you and says, you know, Rob, we need to change this packaging, and obviously new brand managers want to reinvent the wheel or challenge the norms, which they should try. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how, how do you handle that? Usually there has to be a sound business reason for any change on packaging, especially with an organization the size of Campbell's. They, they need to get that in front of the appropriate folks at, at a senior level. So um, it doesn't really initiate or start with a brand manager. He'll say, we want to change red and white. We want it to be green and white. <laughs> um, so luckily that's not going to happen. I, they, they're a pretty savvy group at Campbell's too. So um, the, the biggest challenge for me on, on translating a, um, a design brief or a creative brief to a visual and how we uh, work with companies like Chiquitani Lacroix uh, would be to keep it clean. Keep the communication elements to a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, develop that single most important thing. What, what do you want to stand for as opposed to trying to stand for everything? That's tough. I, what, another obstacle that, that, Campbell's, um, that I find at Campbell's is, is the can, as, as strange as that might sound. Um, because whether you're um, whether you think it's a positive or a negative thing, it can be uh, very polarizing. And for me, when I started there, it was uh, I was lucky enough to get a tour of the plant. So at that plant, where the main head office and marketing is, is actually where all the manufacturing is done for, for Canada. And um, through that tour, you see these truckloads of fresh vegetables coming into the plant, and then you start to think, well, yeah, I guess it has to go in. The goodness has to go into the can. So an obstacle is the can because people think of the can as something that doesn't have good stuff in it. So that's been a huge uh, marketing challenge for Campbell's uh, since I've been there, is to how to reintroduce uh, the goodness in the can to people. And it's truly a, it's a, it's a tough, tough thing for, uh, for a marketer to wrap their collective head around um, that strategy mm -hmm. and how do you communicate that. Um, so we've done things like the lower sodium, which people get, and the visual of uh, um, of the, the salt disappearing that everyone uh, seems to re seems to resonate with a lot of folks. Um, so anyway, that I, I, that's a big thing uh, for me. And the brand managers that want want to make a change with equity, it, brands do have to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, they do have to change. You have to keep them fresh. Um, and so it's a balance. It's, it truly is a balancing act. Balancing act. I think if you understand equity, brand equity, what are the elements that you can touch and what are the ones that you can't? Um, that really assists me in managing design through firms like yours, where we, we can say, we can set out the boundaries, here's what we can touch, here's, here's what's open. Robert, talk a little to me about your career. You know, uh, I know you're at Campbell's now, but yep. what, what, uh, what do you do at Campbell's and what's your background? So um, my role at Campbell's uh, right now is design manager. And uh, I'm kind of the conduit between those brand managers that want to change the red and white label 
and the design firms that we work with and uh, um, uh, promotion companies that we work with. And I also have a link in with World Headquarters and Global Design, making sure that the uh, global standards are adhered to because they're, they're pretty strict. Some of them, we talked a little bit about, about that equity and, and, uh, and standards. Um, so I work with the, um, the brand managers uh, developing a creative brief once a um, packaging project is initiated and decided upon. So, you know, we want to make this change or we have this new product um, that we want to launch in Canada. Uh, packaging is one part of it, as you know, in the whole, in the whole uh, commercialization of a product. Um, there is advertising, uh, packaging design. There is the product. Product needs to be designed. Product needs to be developed. Um, but I work with the brand managers. We develop the creative brief. We engage uh, uh, Shikitani Lacroix with our with our project. Um, and what I bring to the table is I um, I have a design background, so I help translate the brief to visuals hmm. and help the uh, design firms understand what um, what is expected. And I also prompt them with visuals. Um, we'll look at, you know, here's a, here's a great piece of packaging that we've noticed. Is there something here that we can leverage? Is there some learning that we can we can do here? Um, they're they're communicating a message. How can we leverage that to communicate a message? Uh, previous to to Camels, I was at Kraft um, as brand manager again, um, or sorry, design manager, uh, working with the marketing group at Kraft Canada. And then previous to that, I was uh, design design firms uh, in Vancouver, and uh, advertising uh, background as well, creative director and art director for uh, retail uh, companies. I worked for Future Shop, um, World Headquarters in Richmond, um, BC, in Burnaby actually, in Burnaby, BC, and uh, before that at AB Sound. So that goes back about, um, ooh, 15 years, so uh, you know I don't know how far back you want to go, no, JP. Oh, that's but, great. Um, so it's it's a whole gamut, but really for me, it's um, the uh, disciplines that you learn in all of those uh, all of those functions are the same. You're trying to communicate something to your your target audience, your core consumer. Um, you're trying to get a message across, communicate something, you're trying to get them to buy into something that that, that you're, you're you have to say. Great, great. Kevin, we worked uh, on numerous uh, <laughs> projects in the past, and uh, maybe you can share yes, with the have. audience. Yeah, share share with the audience uh, your background. Sure. Um, well, I, I, I'm I guess close to 20 years in in consumer packaged goods. I front half of my career I spent uh, in a variety of different functions with Kraft Canada. Um, I started out way back when in finance and moved quickly into uh, into sales, started category management up um, for, for, for Kraft, uh, later transitioned into marketing and uh, worked on a variety of different portfolios as well as some of the, uh, the famous scale events, I guess, with Kraft. Um, I left to join um, Pepsi QTG over on the Tropicana side to um, lead beverages innovation and then later um, the juice division, with Tropicana and Tropicana Twisters. So, we worked together extensively, I guess, during the Tropicana years. Uh, later joined ConAgra Foods to head up the grocery division and marketing. And of course, I've uh, worked on a number of projects with Chicatani Lacroix on, on that side and brands, everything from Chef Boyardee to, to uh, VH Sauces. Um, most recently, I joined um, uh, Purity Life Health Products as the vice president of marketing. And uh, Purity Life is really a company that is uh, embarking upon a real growth um, in transforming the organization into uh, one that is both branded as well as represents other people's brands. And uh, so my job is to is to really take the branded portfolio, um, both within the purity division and other select divisions across the Synopta parent, and uh, really establish the fundamentals in packaging design and architecture and positioning to, uh, you know, consumer support programs and, and uh, things that drive offtake as well as innovation. So um, challenging task, but uh, obviously one that you need good partners to help you with. Talking about challenges, uh, you know, how has the retail channel distribution changed for you, Rob? Well, I'm not that involved in, in distribution um, and retail channels, but one thing I have noticed um, is they seem to be getting faster. We mm -hmm. produced uh, a new, uh, it was a 
reduced sodium seems to be the thing that Campbell's is is on on a, on a, well they've actually put a stake in the ground. We want to be known for reduced sodium. They reduce the sodium on their top chunky skew skew chicken noodle variety. It's and a great brand. Yeah, chunky is a great brand and uh, very popular um, and risky. So we don't. There are lots of examples out there of formula changes that didn't work. We didn't. We wanted to make sure that this one was going to work. Um, so from uh, production, it it was three weeks to on shelf, and which I had never heard of before. Um, so I think it's improving. I I, it, I think it's, and I don't know what is happening in the background, but it sounds like uh, it's it's very quick. So if you can produce a can of soup at 60 Birmingham in uh, in Toronto, in New Toronto, and it can be on your shelf at in your Sobeys store um, in in Vaughan in three weeks, I think that's pretty good. Wow, that is fast. Kevin, what have you seen in the, because uh, you've been right in the trenches fighting the, uh, <clears throat> the, the wars, so what, what, what change have you seen in channel distribution? Well, I think um, if, you, if you relate it to, to packaging, uh, and in particular um, innovation in your packaging design, which mm-hmm. tends to take a lot of effort and, and people resources and, and, and financial resources, I think in a, in a highly consolidated um, trade base like Canada and the Canadian market, I think the cost of failure is very high. So I think um, you have to really put your best foot forward when you do anything of significance in terms of your packaging design that's, that's truly innovative. Um, you've got a very, very um, hand, small handful of customers that really you do have to um, secure their um, agreement that this is something in principle that you want to move forward with uh, to their shelves to get a chance to, to uh, delight the consumer. And as such, you've got to be very innovative on your packaging. Um, you know, the days of um, just simply you know doing a Me Too, I think, are, are over. If you really want to leverage packaging design to to gain a, a real strong foothold and grow your share, um, I also think too that um, uh, there is a real challenge in terms of um, the proliferation of choices that consumers face and and the ability for you to break through um, within the retail theater. Uh, I've noticed a, a tremendous uh, outpouring of um, uh, you know different uh, choices, everything from smaller <clears throat> niche brands to um, other associated choices as consumers you know take their business and across a blurring uh, stream of channels. So consumers are exposed to to a lot of different choices, and therefore, when you do really want to have a brand that um, will make a true impression, leveraging your packaging. You've got to look for every point of difference you can. So, can you define packaging ROI, Rob? Wow, I looked at this question when you uh, when we had our, our brief meeting previously to the session today, and I thought, whoa, that's that's a weighted question. Um, <laughs> so, I I can. Um, it used to stand for return on investment. I think it is it is all that, which is a lot, but I think it's more. I I think. Um, we are asking consumers, you have to put your consumer hat on when you're talking about return on investment. So as a corporation, of course, you have your shareholders that you have to answer to. You have a business to uphold and, and be profitable with. Um, but the, in the end, the end, at the end of the day, it is the consumer that needs the return on your investment and on their investment. And I think it's through brands that, that we can actually touch that consumer in an emotional way and, and make sure that they come back to the shelf and, and, and purchase our products. Um, so it means return on investment. It means investment. Uh, you're asking the consumer to invest something, his time, her time, mm-hmm. their money to purchase your product. Um, you're, but in order to maintain that interaction, I think you have to be innovative. So I, I think return on ROI, there's a lot of I words. I think you need to be innovative. Um, you need to you need to have a great imagination. Um, Kevin touched on it uh, earlier. You, you, I've heard someone say um, at, at other seminars, "Innovate or die." Um, if you don't innovate, consumers won't know you're there. You'll you will just be a blur, a blur, and 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 you'll you'll miss that that transaction. Um, so you need the imagination. You need to be integrated in all your com- communication pieces. Um, so uh, it it's a there's a lot to it. Um, as far as a design project, if you make a change, you need to make sure that you're making a change for the right reasons. 
that it does elevate your brand. It creates some new news. Um, back to the, the earlier question about distribution channels, the, um, the customers that we work with, like the Sobeys and the Loblaws and um, Metro, they, uh, they get excited about new news. Hmm. If you can come to them with new news and, um, and they can then communicate that to their, their consumers, which are our consumers, all our consumers, which is us, um, they get excited and they can make sure that you have the appropriate amount of space in, in their retail arena. Um, so the return on investment is, is an ongoing thing, but if you can make sure that that design is for all the right reasons and that you understand the equity that we talked about earlier and uh, you, with a healthy nod to, you know, we understand that equity, but we do need to move this forward. Mm. We need to be innovative. We need to be imaginative. Um, we need to create new news. Um, then you will, that return will happen. But you also have to have a product that people love mm. and it will, they'll come back to. And that's part of the innovation and the integration and, and the imagination that I talked a, a little bit about. Um, it's the integrity as well. So you need that integrity in your product. If the integrity is there and you've covered all those other I's, ROI's, um, then the investment will be worthwhile. You know, you put uh, definition of ROI in a very different context. That uh, is great. I've never uh, actually heard it put that way, but it's so appropriate. It's so true today with uh, competitive set, you know, the speed to market and, uh, and, and getting that return on investment has to happen a lot shorter than it used to be where we'd, we'd be willing to wait two or three years to get that return now. If that product is yeah. not successful in the marketplace in eight months, it's you're not getting your ROI. Kevin, any any thoughts? Anything to add to the ROI question? Um, well, GP, I, I have a I have a call it a, a three step I guess you could say process that I would equate uh, or I would evaluate ROI for packaging. Um, first one is is before I go to market, and it's basically two letters um, PI and PD. So it's purchase intent and point of difference. So to me, whatever news you're bringing that is either going to provide the consumer with another positive experience or it's going to overcome a, a barrier or an issue that they may have with your packaging or the experience with your brand, um, I, I weigh heavily, in, particularly in quantitative research, purchase intent. If it is significantly above a norm um, and indicates that the consumer is going to vote for your brand before you actually spend all the energy to commercialize it and take it all the way to, to the shelf and ultimately to their pantry, um, to me, that gives me really good indication that I'm going to have some success and I can mobilize a lot of resources behind it. Um, and a point of difference to me is something I, I absolutely crave in every packaging initiative that I do. So getting a strong point of difference or the uniqueness score that I typically see, again, I heavily weight that. Those two metrics allow me to feel confident going forward. Once it hits market, I have a real simple measure to measure the success in ROI and packaging design. It's get it grow my share. Um, and I think obviously you need to tease a lot of different things, but um, ultimately, if you're doing something that is significantly going to affect and touch the consumer day in, day out, it better grow your share in your category. Um, and I would say the last element that I could wrap it all up in, and this is, I guess, maybe goes back to either my finance friends or my finance roots. It's uh, in an ideal state, it improves your profitability. So in the days, uh, obviously, that we live in right now, you know, I love the idea of the concept of sustainability in, in, in packaging design. If there's an opportunity where you can drive cost of your system um, that's good for the environment and that uh, that uh, the consumer won't miss or will actual fact, uh, you know, thank you for it. I think it's a fantastic way to, to challenge yourself with packaging design. So look at what we did with recently with the Vivitas Woman uh, design where, you know, we moved to a, a far superior packaging um, in our you know, uh, tapered bottle, and we, we threw out the corrugate. We saved enough corrugate that would probably stack you know, three times the height, I think we calculated as a CN tower in a wow. year on that brand. And that's good. Um, and that drives cost effectiveness in our system. It, it reduces handling costs down the line, and it, uh, it's good for the environment, and it's good for the cost savings that ultimately hopefully I can pump into either more packaging innovation down the road or ways in which to, to drive the offtake to the consumer. So. I, you know, PI and PD and grow my share and save me a little bit of money. That's how I wrap it all up. So what's your definition of the blink factor? Ralph, if I were to say to you blink factor, what does that mean to you? And what does that mean to the packaging process? 
Uh, for me, it's the, well, it used to be called the five second, five foot rule or the billboard rule. Um, but now I think it's three second or one second or a blink. You have a blink to communicate um, the compelling reason why the consumer should part with her hard earned cash and make that purchase. Um, you don't have, it, so you have to communicate brand. Um, for us, it's variety. And, and also since we're selling food, um, it's appetite appeal. So it's kind of like the three things that we have to get across in, in a blink of an eye. So mm -hmm. you, it's probably one second now. Right? You've probably measured it. Um, but it's, it's those three things. Those are the, those are core. And, um, it's, it is a struggle because you tend to want to put all the information on the label, well, not just on the label, on the PDP, on the, plate, on the thing that's facing out. Everything's got to be there, and it's a struggle. And uh, you know, sometimes we have some great successes with with something that is successful. It, it, it has the blink factor, and I think um, the redesign that we worked with um, with Shakitani Lacroix, the redesign of the broths, um, Campbell's broths, uh, I think is successful uh, because of the blink factor because you look at it and if you blinked at all three of those varieties well there's actually five but two of them are low sodium um, you get in a blink what it is the variety and the brand so um, that's what it is to me it's it's that one second time that you have to to make that emotional connection and sway the consumer to buy your product definitely yeah. and and um and i think you know, all the metrics and measuring and, um, you know, psychographics and you can have someone sitting down and measure their eye movements, have all that that goes in, into uh, redesigning and, and research and, and background before something hits the shelf is all valid. But unless, if there's not an emotional connection, um, I think you'll be lost. I think if, if the bullying factor communicates those three pragmatic things, but within the design, it is emotional, then you'll be successful. You know, what, uh, <clears throat> what's your take on the blink factor? You know, what's your view on the blink factor? I, I guess I'm a simple guy, JP. I, <laughs> I look at it like um, if you closed your eyes, what would you see on your packaging? And uh, I look at it really in a, in a very simple way. And I'll relate it to, I guess, a story of one of the brands I've worked on. Um, of my four kids, typically of the youngest ones, you know, and I, they, they've known dads worked on a number of brands over the years. And, and it's really striking when they actually take a piece of paper and they draw a picture of, of your brand, of your package. <laughs> and I'm, I'm always fascinated by what, uh, what one of my daughters or my son will do. And, and uh, it typically reinforces the things that the consumer, I believe, mm -hmm. would take away in the blink of an eye on your bought package. Yeah. Um, I remember cringing when somebody gave the nod um, in the U.S. to to remove the straw and orange from the Tropicana Pure yeah. Premium card. Ooh. Yeah, that's a big one. And I thought about it in the context of, you know, as how I evaluate, you know, what, what resonates really quickly in the blink of an eye. And I remember my, my son Nolan, you know, he's, he's six, and uh, how he drew, you know, a picture of some of the brands I'd worked on. You know, and one of them was, was Tropicana. And he drew gable top carton mm -hmm. and emblazoned right in the middle of it was a, an orange with a straw on it. And I thought that was quite striking, just that fact that he took that away and he he doesn't pay a lot of attention to, you know, he's, he's six year old, so he was looking around him and everything under, under, the, under the sun. But in the blink of an eye, that's what registers with him. And, you know, you take away something like that and I think you lose your identity. And uh, so okay. I, I, I look upon it as just like that. And, and I, I actually, I, I try to talk to some of my the marketers on my team and folks I've worked with that are a little bit more junior over the years, and I say, you know, you got to close your eyes and, and, and imagine mm -hmm. your product, okay, and and you're close to it, and open your eyes and then write down the three top three things that you remember. Could be a color, could be an icon, could be a, a shape, whatever that is. That's typically that's what it. the consumer is going to walk away for it with, yeah. and uh, so I say, the more powerful you can make those things stick better you'll be. Yeah, there's actually was a huge study done on promotional packaging in the U.S. And, uh, and to get to what retention elements on the packaging, they actually studied with kids. Mm -hmm. And they actually asked children to draw their cereal box. Mm -hmm. oh, and what are the strange. elements they could draw both top, bottom, sides, 
and face panels. It was very interesting to find out what are the key elements uh, that they would remember. And the things that the marketers mm -hmm. thought they would take for granted are the things that they didn't even notice. So it was great, great insights. I think that that's a great tool, you know, to really find out what the core equities of your brand is, is if, uh, if, uh, if a child can remember them, uh, you know that they are working effectively because they're not dependent on language and readership. Yeah, and they don't have the filters. No, we do. Right. So <laughs> yeah. they kind of know, you know, what gets through. Yep, and what they remember. What are the major challenges that packaging can help overcome, Rob? Yeah, you got some good questions. Yeah. I think uh, the, the busy, well, busy lifestyles, busy shelves. Um, I think there's something like 20,000 new products put out every year. Um, so packaging can assist that wayfinding. So how I can find that product that I'm looking for. Um, if you understand the elements that assist in that wayfinding, and I think we've talked about it earlier, like let's keep it simple. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of the blink factor and closing your eyes and what do you imagine? If you can maintain that in your packaging, in your design, um, then I think that's one of the things that you can help. Packaging can help overcome is that busyness, that shelf. Um, if you have if you have amazing equity, like I'm lucky to work with the Campbell's brands, um, that helps too because you know the red and white. You're already you're already halfway there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can assist in people finding their favorite variety by making that simple. Um, Packaging will be successful. Yeah. Will we'll help help them overcome that obstacle. Yeah, very true. There's a we had, we wrote a white paper <clears> that uh, you can download on the Design Lounge called Packaging ROI, and there was a large study done on what are the most effective elements of packaging, and what they found out in the research was was quite insightful uh, and and really twisted a bit of the thinking of the marketers was shoppability of the category. Is yes. the most critical element in the yeah. package design. How that consumer navigates the category and finds your brand and then the variety within your brand really decides if they're going to buy your product or yeah. not. And so that true. was very insightful. It was quite surprising that and how important that element was in the marketing mix or the packaging mix. So in the case of yourself, Kevin, what are the challenges that packaging help overcome? Um, well, I, I, I look at... Um, tend to look at a lot of the marketing mix elements in, in three different ways, I guess a triangle, if you will, um, on some macro trends. So experiential, um, health and wellness and nutrition, and, um, and then convenience. Um, and I think if you touch any one of those angles these days, in, in particularly in consumables and food, um, I think you, you'll win with your packaging. Um, and I also, I also place a great deal of emphasis on um, yes, I, I believe that it's critical, as I call it, the, they, they call it the, um, uh, the moment of truth at the shelf to purchase. But I also believe that you've really got to do a great job of um, really taking advantage of uh, and really capitalizing on how the um, packaging will reinforce how the brand lives in the consumer's life. Um, and by that, I, 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 there's all sorts of pieces of innovation in packaging that I've looked at over the years that I, I think are strokes of brilliance um, in Addressing that, um, I think of when um, when folks in the uh, confectionery industry with gum made a decision in their blister packs to perforate down the middle so that when you used half, you were able to tear it off and reduce the overall amount of space it occupied in the consumer's pocket purse, etc. I think that's brilliant. I think when you look at um, if you add an element of ease or, or, or of usage, whether it be your instructions on how to cook or you know, emblazoned in the right place to easily um, reinforce it and are simplified on your packaging. You know, one, two, three, I think that's brilliant. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, you know, where you do things that will, you know, facilitate a positive experience every time you touch it, um, uh, the product that in, the, in your life, in the home, I think it's brilliant as well. I, I look at a, you know, recent uh, example of that is uh, just in something as simple as, as detergent, you know, and my wife made a, a comment the other day where she said, you know, isn't it great that this fits in the cupboard now? Hmm. Right? And, and so I, I think if you look as a marketer or packaging designer and you, and you try to think through the lens of the consumer on how it will integrate into their That's everyday true. life, I think, uh, 
you know, you'll come up with those gems and right. that, that, that really will help take your brand a step above mm. the others. So Rob, what project has really demonstrated the power of the bike factor? If you look back at all the projects you've worked on, you've worked on numerous projects. Yes. And you said that that one given project really nailed, you know, the benefits of the blink factor. Which project would that be? And explain a little bit about the background. Yeah, I'd have to say it was the the redesign that we worked on with Shigatani Lacroix um, on the Campbell's Broths. I think when you look at um, where we were and where we are now, it's too bad I didn't have them here because like I'd love to hold them up because you get what well, you can buy them in the store. You, <laughs> you can you can get them in the store in Canada. Um, you get, I think it's a good example of the bling factor, but I think you have to look at the change. So, and it wasn't revolutionary because it, you know, we had the red and white equity in there. We had the camel's cornerstone in there. Um, but that change and, and Kevin talked about it a little bit came about because of the insight we had with the consumer. Mm -hmm. And that was that, and, and no, no huge aha here, but we wanted to focus on the cooking aspect of broths. Well, it seems obvious, but how do you get that across? Yeah. You look at where you are and where you want to be. Um, that becomes your strategy. And through that, we decided to show that we did the delicious photography yeah. we worked on um, uh, with uh, Rob Tioka. And uh, we had the, the recipe end dish on the front, of course, the Campbell's branding and the variety. And they, you know, it, it's the struggle that we all go through. How can we communicate the, the other benefits, the claims and stuff? Well, we kept those to a minimum. And through clean design, clean, strong design, I think it wins out every, every day. And um, that would be one that I would hold up. And, I, and it's one that is, is a good example. Um, like I said, you have to compare it to where we were. Um, another one uh, would be the uh, soup at hand uh, redesign where we decided to leverage the U.S. red and white equity in the soup at hand brand. Um, really, and, and what that has to do with the bling factor is it's just a simpler label to look at. Good. Kevin, if you looked at the Blink Factor, what, what, what project comes to mind that you say really nails it? Can I get props, JP? <laughs> yeah. Am I allowed to get props? Sure. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, we've, we've worked on so many projects over the years in various different companies, but I, 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 what I really like is uh, one of them that stands out most recent is, is, uh, is Urban. Um, and Urban's an all-natural throat loss machine. And I think... Uh, on many levels across the packaging, it did everything that that I think the Blink Factor is supposed to do. Um, I mean, it was a it was a very tired brand when it was bought, basically, and and it was completely <coughs> revamped. Um, everything from you know the back of the panel where we placed a an easy to navigate um, benefits um, communication to the consumer uh, that talked about everything with the no artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, all natural sweeteners, and all natural active ingredients to addressing things that, that have been barriers historically with the, the standard zipper that you would normally have to open a pack, but we, we created our own where you actually created almost a spout to pour it and easier to reseal to everything from, you know, the format of the product itself in a, in a lozenge on a su that's a sucker um, to the pillow pack wow. version of, instead of the twist tie. Um, and even the communication that's down on the actual brand itself, um, I think reinforced particularly in a, in a product where fortunately um, people don't habitually use these. They cycle in and they cycle out of the brand according mm -hmm. to the need state. And I think uh, it just makes it much, that much more critical that you touch as many elements as you can in your packaging so you're having a positive experience with the brand mm -hmm. every time you, you, you interact with it. So I think, um, I mean, this one, this one to me is, is, is a real good example where you address uh, all of those aspects. Um, I, I also think it's, it's there's a, the other one that comes to mind is, is when we, we basically launched the Vividus Woman brand. And everything on this one, and you know, we've, we've gathered a lot of awards and recognition on this one, but um, really deciding to focus our target on women and then mm -hmm. ask ourselves everything that we could possibly do in our packaging design that would delight women. Um, right down to you know, looking at the the tapering of the bottle, so it was a it was a shape that 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 in the hand would feel comfortable to the graphics and the imagery on the pack that were very feminine and fresh and bright and energetic, um, to the simplification and addressing um, all of the different aspects of I'm having a hard time navigating through all the various components of the 
um, category. So I need to know what's an everyday essential, what's a basic, what's an immunity product. So color coding and banding that on the product. Right down to the name itself and, and, and the logo of reinforcing Vivid as Woman to say that, that this is a product and a brand, line of product that is for you. And I think that's that's a factor that, you know, I, I look back to, as I said, where you <clears throat> close your eyes and if you can, or if you can have a child, draw your pack. Mm -hmm. I mean, the attention to detail when you do do as a design of a product, I think is key. If you can close your eyes and you picture a certain shape of pack as this does, I think that's a big win. Um, and if you could close your eyes and you can see a flower, it's a big win. So, uh, yeah, a couple of them. And uh, don't get me started, JP, because I could probably go back in time and list a lot right. more. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm just going to wrap up uh, one last question. Which brands can uh, we learn from that demonstrate the effectiveness of packaging and branding? If you looked out there and looked at some brands that have done a really good job of leveraging packaging and branding, uh, Rob, what brand comes to mind if you were to pick one? One. One. My right. Desert Island brand? Your Desert Island brand, yeah. No, it'd be Apple. Ah, oh, Apple. It'd have to be Apple for all the reasons that, <laughs> that everyone knows. Um, through their store experience, their pack, you order something on, from their website and it comes in a box, you know what it is. Um, just clean, clear design. They have integrity. Um, I heard a story once about Steve Jobs. He, one of his first jobs, he, when he was walking home, he used to he used to go by a, a typographer studio. And he was real intrigued by this by typography. We don't often talk about typography much no, uh, or. these days, but um, he, you know, talked to the old master and what are you doing and why are you doing that? And and if you look at their brand standards, it's based on type. Yeah, it's based on pure type, um, and and simple, clear messaging. So that would be the one. Good. That's a good one. I mean, it's a it's a gold standard, Kevin. Wow, um, tough one, JP. Uh, and I was going to say, I think he, he grabbed my answer. I was going to say the iPod because I think it's it's a really yeah. uh, a very very uh, iconic, I guess you could say, design. Um, I guess uh, if I step back and I and I, and I think about it, um, there's there's a lot of great brands out there. Um, one of the ones that pops to mind, actually, ironically, uh, we were just doing a naming exercise today, but I think BlackBerry's done a great job. Um, and so I think when RIM um, chose to go forward with that brand, I think, um, you know, there were some very, very simple things that they did that, that I think uh, really, really resonate with the consumer. You could call yourself a, a name, you know, a lot of people say what's in a name, um, by uh, you know creating a brand that stayed very close to home, but they took a very different stance, and uh, I think you know that stands so far apart in terms of differentiation that I think it's it's an incredible power uh, in that in that name alone right, mm -hmm. that you carry forward, um, and I think uh, you know everything from the experience with the brand I think is 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 truly unique, um, and uh, so I, I think that's a really good one in design. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts and insights with our audience. And uh, and uh, we're going to open the lines. Uh, so uh, look in the PowerPoint presentation. You'll see there's a toll-free number there that you can call in if you have any questions. Uh, we'll hold the lines open for uh, another 10, 15 minutes to answer any one of your questions. Also, you can download this presentation and uh, a white paper on the Blink Factor. Uh, you can see on in the uh, left-hand window, there's a place there where you can download those files. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to your questions. Take care. Thank you.